Let's go. Yeah. So, Hardy, do you know that about 60% of our viewers actually aren't subscribed to our YouTube channel, but they're still watching our videos? What the? Like, why? Why would they do something like that? I I really don't know. I think it would help, though, if before we start the episode, we just kind of ask them to subscribe and, you know, like and hit the bell not to miss anything. Uh, all of that stuff, like, right in the get-go. Okay. okay, subscribe, hit the bell. And like. And That's like. right. Okay. Yes. Time to get into the episode. Let's go. Are we done? Okay. Yeah, that's, that, that's amazing. Right. Welcome to Sprechen Kotlin. Did I say that right, Seb? Sprechen Kotlin. Yeah, I mean, cl close enough. Again, it doesn't really work grammatically, but, uh, you know, I appreciate the uh, the German effort you got going there. It's like I've been practicing this for the whole um, two minutes, okay? So give me a break. So how amazing. you been, Seb? You know, it's uh, it's it's been pretty good. Uh, my room is very, very warm today. I, I cannot wait to get out because I uh, I got a dinner date for uh, some nice German beer garden food later on. Oh, nice! And, yeah. and is it is it pleasant outside? Is it like a beer garden weather, which you have like a twenty five degrees breeze? Now, is it like that, or is it like humid and? Ugh, as long hot. as you're in the shadows, it's fine. Uh, when you get the okay. the direct sunlight, it it gets a bit toasty very quickly. Yeah, I can't wait to get out either. It's so hot today. And uh, apparently we're getting a new heat wave. Like, it's funny, okay? I'm sorry, we have to do the obligatory uh, weather segment. But uh, I read in the paper uh, a couple of days ago that it's like, the first summer heat wave is about to hit. I'm like, then what the hell were all those other things that kept hitting for the past <laughs> month, right? I mean, we've reached 39, 40, 41 degrees Celsius, and they're saying now the first summer heat wave is about to come. So go figure. It's yeah. like the, between the waves of the COVID and the waves of the heat, like the only waves that I haven't seen this summer is actual waves in the sea. Yeah. So who do we have today talking to us about waves? Uh, 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 Kotlin. Yeah, today we uh, we have Mohit Saveya, who's a Google developer expert uh, in Kotlin and Android. Um, and we're going to be talking about coroutines. Hey, welcome to the show. Hey, uh, it's great great to be. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's my first time ever being on a podcast. It's kind of nervous. And it'll probably be your last because you're like, after this crap, I ain't going on any other podcast. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but that'll be entirely our fault, not yours. So don't worry. Uh, totally, totally. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where are you based? I'm uh, currently in New Jersey, which is uh, close to New York. And uh, that's where I am. Yeah. And is it is it hot there like like it's hot everywhere else in the world? Or is it nice and cool there? It was. It's hot. Uh, there's it's hot. like 95. Um, there was actually yesterday there was a... Uh, thunderstorms and uh well the lights went out and i was hoping that the lights would come on so that i could make it to this podcast <laughs> oh wow 95 for our uh, european viewers out there that is 35 degrees celsius you see how quick i am oh. yeah. wow amazing did you google that <laughs> google have... it's okay. so cool <laughs> uh so mohit um, what's kind of like your your background? Because well, we're we're talking about uh, Kotlin, we're talking about coroutines, obviously. Um, so I just kind of wondering, how did you get into all of this? Well, first, maybe writing or learning uh, Kotlin yourself, but then also going on and teaching Kotlin and coroutines to other people. So uh, I started using Kotlin around 2015, and I was fortunate to work with a lot of great developers, you know, in my so far in my career. And I worked alongside with someone who was tech editing the Kotlin in Action book. And uh, he was actually on your podcast and he's a great developer and he introduced me to Kotlin. And uh, it's, it's been really, uh, since then on, I, I worked with, you know, my, my colleague to convert like a lot of code to Kotlin, had 80% well before Google supported it. From there on, basically everywhere I've been helped in some way to 
implement Kotlin going from 80 to not a place which has zero percent and helping basically to increment uh, you know helping to get it to 50 percent and then going to another place so throughout my career so far basically have helped you know people to implement Kotlin that's how I started and learned the language uh when I started off you know as you know, like my colleague was tech editing call in action, but there were very few use resources at that time. So basically I learned mostly Kotlin by converting a lot of code. And uh, the great, the, a lot of positive things happened with that. And the, uh, and I enjoyed it basically from there on. Does your colleague have a name? Oh yeah, <laughs> Brent, <laughs> Brent Watson. Yeah. So you are now giving workshops, uh, and particularly one interesting aspect is that you're doing workshops around coroutines, right? I started to use coroutines when I remember, I think it was when there was the Kotlin Conf in SF. Where, uh, and uh, I remember from there on, so I taught myself coroutines, and uh, I was very, very much interested in it and helped different people to to learn it to integrate it into some simple features and uh, from there on Kotlin has evolved obviously so I've given a lot of presentations on on it and uh, which have evolved over time as the technology as the coroutines library has evolved I basically a lot of it is from my experience I I learned coroutines by helping other people in the community to pair programming with them to to you know to think do things such as testing for implementing it on back end and on android so today um i had a so how it started is that i always wanted to be a teacher i actually wanted to be a math teacher but i realized that it's better to be a programmer <laughs> so <laughs> the and uh i remember so one of the things great things about Kotlin, how it has affected me is that i needed i wanted some medium to be able to create content to be able to share it and uh we're back in my first you know yeah, i've been very active in the new york Kotlin community you know there are meetups here like you know kevin gallican from touch lab he runs the android and Kotlin meetup you know he always gives me an opportunity to speak thank you for him <laughs> if he's listening uh Shout out. And, <laughs> shout out to him. Um, I basically have used the Feynman technique for the past since 2017 and learned something and try to teach it to other people and helps you to reinforce your uh, understanding of it. And with coroutines, uh, the way it started is I had a, you know, a friend who wanted to learn coroutines and I came up with a lesson plan and uh, Obviously, there's a lot of content already out there, you know, now so much content on the basics and learning about the vocabulary of like, what is a job, etc. Then the, that's the first plateau. And the second plateau of learning it is applying it. And that's, that's where the challenge is. So I came up with to teach people, you know, in the community co-routines and, and to teach my friend and he was looking for a job and he wanted to get into Kotlin and, and coroutines and came up with basically uh, each each lesson had a lab exercise, which was a lab exercise was heavily influenced from, you know, from my experience over the years. Uh, and uh, each lab exercise, like it took the lesson and asked you to implement it in a use case. And I tailored it either for a back end or for Android. I had a testing part in there. My, one of the biggest challenges is testing coroutines. And it's all, I'm also get slumped there uh, when I try to figure out why my test failed. And I think we can, we can dive into that, uh, but let's take a step back a, a second. Have you taught coroutines to people that have not done any kind of uh, asynchronous programming? Or is your target audience essentially folks that already have suffered or suffered or done 
you know, have, have experience with other ways of doing program. Well, because I say suffered because, you know, there are folks that are suffering with co-routines now, right? And um, yeah. I, I want to get into that. But it, has it been with people that have tried alternatives to co-routines? Or is your audience or also people that are completely new to this concept? So for me, uh, my my audience and the people I've, uh, you know, in the community that I help is that uh, they, they have done asynchronous. They either use Rx Java heavily on Android or have experience building like callback based APIs. Someone has a background in Rx Java. Uh, so my my background is not really a lot in Rx Java, mostly in coroutines because wherever my my experience, you know, are in the code bases I worked in Rx Java was not really used a lot. Uh, it was basically callback based APIs. So for someone who has a background in Rx Java and they have common questions is that, you know, what what is the mapping of like a, for example, a subject on and in and, and, and the coroutines world? That's that's a common question that you you commonly get. Yeah, so that uh, I have not, you know, had the opportunity to teach someone who, you know, just, just starting off in programming. <laughs> So uh, just uh, so that people can kind of understand this, because workshop is a pretty abstract term. Um, are you is is this like a, a four hour thing, or is is this something that spans like multiple days, multiple lessons? Like how how much time do you think people need until they can you know be proficient with the with the ba let's say the basics of coroutines? Basically, you know, I mean, I broke it apart into twenty lessons, and so for example, with my friend, we'd always meet up every week, you know, one day every week and, and, you know, it's up to him to do the homework. <laughs> so he, after that, so it's, uh, I remember giving basically one workshop where it was basically, uh, broken apart in two parts, not, you know, 20 lessons. And it was basically, uh, one every other week so that people have the opportunity to digest the material. So now those are the different formats uh, experience with like looking at this and and working with working with like newcomers and people who just start out are there particular challenges that you would say like people face regularly when they when they first interact with coroutines so my i'll give you an example of a use case um which is which has to do with testing uh common thing so that i found back on, on back end in android so my my expertise is in building grpc services and uh and implementing them using coroutine so i remember in the community you know i worked with someone who basically i found that there are common problems in doing that too is that so in the community today, there are different frameworks that allow you to that model basically, you know, gRPC streams using either channels or flows. And uh, I remember uh, helping someone to may build an isolated service using a frame, open source framework like Curl Plus, and uh, commonly used by you know a lot of people. Great framework. And the internet models uh, streams, you know. Uh, if you want to send something back from your basically your controller you would send in that stream to a channel one common thing that you may have in there you may have a service that has some particular delay and uh, and and you you know you may delay for some amount of time to send the next amount next response so one of the common things that you know when you go to test it you know is that how do you handle like you know, time, you know, like if you have, there's something called like advanced time by, you know, uh, uh, utilities that are provided by the calling coroutines library. One, I remember helping, you know, in the community people who common uh, problem they run into is that the, you know, they get to, uh, they're running a test is not on the dispatcher in which they're delaying on in their code. They imagine uh, basically, like when you create a test, you know, you have this utility run blocking test that internally creates a test coroutine dispatcher and you run your test in it. And, uh, and you, but in your actual, in what you're testing, you may have, you know, a different dispatcher that you're using and you have code which has a particular delay. And, um, 
and you may be doing some verification after that delay happens. And uh, one good practice that was shared at Colin Conf is that you inject your dispatcher in there. So whatever type of component you're building, and when you inject it, basically you could then basically inject the test coroutine dispatcher, and you could you know call advanced time by have more control over you have control over the virtual time clock. And that's one, for example, one common problem that I found uh, in, in helping people in different use cases uh, on back end and on, on Android and on front end. So, so you would say that the main pitfall that people encounter with coroutines is testing, that most other things they seem to grasp pretty well? Uh, no. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's a yeah. combination of things. So testing is one of them. It just came to my mind. But uh, for example, uh, another thing is that, you know, I guess so for in the last couple of months, helping people to use a uh, mutable shared flow, for example, understanding, you know, you understanding, you know, you have to set a replay count uh, to get into situations where you created a mutable shared flow, but you emitted something to it, but you didn't get a response. and. And to rect it to resolve that, like, you could ask questions such as like, you know, did you set the right replay count? And I think that we can touch a, we can touch the flow stuff a little bit uh, later on. But let's go back to the very basics, right? Do you have people that are using Rx Java or are using some other mechanism for accomplishing the tasks they want to? And then you introduce them to coroutines and you say, hey, look, coroutines is great because hey. It's uh, just like you are flowing your code in a normal way. And uh, all you have to do is add these uh, suspend functions. And then you have to, uh, you know, have this uh, uh, context. And, and do people grasp that easily? No. <laughs> one, one of the challenges is that so most people they 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 have they go into and they they have looked at a lot of resources so one what what you don't see in the new concept that they have to grasp is uh, creating a scope that you could have a parent scope you could structure your coroutines where you could have you know a parent coroutine which has a child's scope understanding basically like uh, how cancellation works those types of basics are uh that's that's the uh, dealing with scopes i think uh, is one challenging part that people have I, i've had but is is there something like is there is there a good way for you to explain like the the benefits to them specifically like is there like maybe one one or two like key concepts that we would say once they once they understand that particular part about scopes for example uh, that's like when it clicks, like those kind of aha moments. I think it it would clicks basically once you have gone through uh, a, a different use cases where you know you have to create hierarchies of your know, coroutines, uh, such as you know parent and and and, and child coroutines, and in it, and uh, it starts to click from what I've seen when you have worked with a varied complexity of use cases. Uh, there isn't, it's not like, you know, it's like one concept or looking at one visual picture and you just get it. It's, uh, it's, it's a process. So, for example, uh, when, when I help someone to architect something, like, for example, one common thing is that I help someone in the community is that in the back end is, you know, creating a producer consumer, you have one coroutine, which is basically running, creating content, you know, it's taking just in content, communicating with the database and another coroutine that's listening to basically what this other coroutine is, you know, is outputting. So we do, we do a lot of visual, uh, basically, uh, whiteboarding to be able to understand basically, uh, to try different approaches with coroutines. So yeah, so to answer your question, it's uh, you know, the most important part in the second plateau of learning coroutine is implementing, being, implementing in many use cases, basically getting that experience under your belt. Okay, so it's, it's really about like looking at different cases and 
like essentially working out for yourself what part of of the concurrency support that we have uh can be applied here and then just kind of you know make the mental note when i encounter a, a, a similar pattern again uh th this is going to help me out so a lot of people they they the question they ask is where how do i start you know they they have read basically the documentation how do you start in terms of applying what you have read, what you have learned, and that's and that's the challenge. So then, what happened to the promise, the the promise of hey, use core routines and it'll be much simpler API, and you don't have to learn a whole bunch of new stuff, and you could just, you know, use the code that you used to have and uh, do cool asynchronous programming and and things like that. Did you do you think that the promise fell short? No, I think uh, the promise is there. <laughs> it's uh, when, so it, it varies. I mean, that, you know, the people's opinions on that vary. I remember working with someone who who still likes Rx Java, doesn't like core routines because they find it complicated. Much of it is because it's subjective, because, you know, they they have a lot of experience and in, in, in the core routines and in the Rx Java APIs. So it's really, uh, I, what I like about it is that, and to me, in my opinion, there it is. There is that, and with coroutines, like you know, it's uh, there are simple constructs that you could use. Not a lot of them that you have to learn in order to be able to implement your use cases, whether that's shared flow, state flow, and uh, and different types of channels. And so, in my opinion, I think uh, the promise is there. <laughs> And now coming with flow, and we have hot and cold flows. And of course, if you're familiar with Rx, you have hot streams and cold streams. New concepts are coming along. Uh, how do you feel about that? That's been uh, so a challenge. One of the things that I, I, you know, had to, I went over with a lot of you know, several people and helping them out, pair programming with them in the community was that like a cold flow, you know, you every time you collect from it, you know, they will the upstream will start again, you know, it will consistently give you the same result. And then and differentiating with the hot flow, like a shared flow, which is independent of your collector, explaining that concept. Yeah, that that's a challenge. Uh basically if someone who basically, you know, doesn't have a lot of async experience with hot and cold flows from rx one one of the challenges is that knowing when to use a state flow or like a mutual state flow or shared flow and uh, it's all depends on like you have a use case and these two constructs they give you these two types of hot flows they give you they have different feature sets and uh, one of the great things about so state flow, for example, has the ability to com it conflates, you know, uh, could conflate back to back emissions. But a shared flow has like these extra features where you could set a replay count, a buffer overflow, like these types of things. And uh, you have to weigh in like what what what's better, what's good for you. So on Android, many people in the community they basically. Uh, you know, they modeled, you know, from the view model or whatever you have presenter to model a stream. They should stream a state. They use to commonly use a, a mutable state flow and you'll see it in the Android examples. And, uh, but if you're building, so I remember working with someone to build like a, uh, long ago, a, uh, like broadcasting systems. And, uh, I remember, uh, you know, using a broadcast channel basically. And but now you know you could replace it with a shared flow, and uh, there there is a transition, a conversion that you could do from one to the other that's you know outlined really well in the documentation. So yeah, it, it depends on which which construct you use, depends on your use case and what feature you know that fits your use case from these constructs. You actually did mention uh mentioned like just generally the the Android world a moment ago. And while both Hadi and I are uh, non Android uh non mobile developers, so uh I think it would actually be be quite interesting to 
to hear a little bit more about uh, the connection of of coroutines and and the Android world. Do you feel that they've kind of reached their their full potential on Android? Do you, do you, are there still like rough edges where you where you still kind of have to to work around maybe what was there before? Uh, what's that looking like? So when I when I started using it uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I basically started with a simple case, you know, not even using any type of channels or or anything like that. Just a simple core routine. That simple suspending function basically, you know, gets some data, gives it back, and uh, so since there on, you know, it the usage of it. And the great thing is that you know it has support from Google, so and that is really helping to increase adoption. When I started, I mean, I remember the pushback. One one thing, like for example, some feedback I got from someone was. Rx Java. This was when it started to use it. Rx Java is a lot used a lot in the industry. It's been tested, you know, a lot in the industry. So we shouldn't, you know, adopt coroutines. That was the pushback when I when I first started using it. Uh, when I heard that, I said, you know, that's a good title for my next talk. <laughs> uh, you know, battle testing coroutines. Uh, I think I gave that away. So. <laughs> <laughs> the the and the current routine so and that that's a challenge that that was a challenge when it started but that that has eased off because google you know has in their documentation so many examples of it and and they you know with chatpack compose and i think uh that uses it internally in several places so and that's been a big game changer <laughs> so one of the things that you know is that is teaching you know uh learning teaching other people you have to get them up to speed to learn this new tech you know that that's where my solution was setting up just workshops you know of uh, every week to share some particular type of knowledge on coroutines and that helped that helped a lot but talking about adoption how do you feel the support of coroutines has been in in other in popular frameworks and do you see the community making good use of it? Yeah. So for me, uh, one of the big things is that th there's a library that came out, GRPC Kotlin, that used coroutines. And that was, uh, you know, something that was big, you know, at least for me. And, uh, and so many other people in the, that open source library was uh, great. There, there are so many libraries that, you know, for example, like, binding to a particular review. For example, there used to be a library in the Android where everyone, a lot of people use Rx binding. So that like, for example, you click on something and it's exposed to you as a string, like whatever you're typing, for example, you could convert like in a text view, you know, uh, the text watcher, I think API into a stream. And now, you know, there are people that have the flow, it's called flow binding library, which is great. But one, one other thing is that what I saw is that when I started to use coroutines, I started to come up with a testing pattern. For example, in Rx Java, there's something called a test observer. And and I found that the pattern that I was using like was very similar to what's used in the SQL Delight library, which has coroutine support. And they have an extension on the flow, which is which is provides a really nice API. Oh, thank, shout out to them. Thank you for creating uh, uh, the open source down to a library called Turbine. That that, that was nice, uh, at least in my opinion, <laughs> for testing. Uh, provides you with a nice API where it has like, suppose you're testing a flow, you want to verify that it emits things and it completes. So there, so you could do flow.test inside that Lambda block. You could have expect item and verify. You could do expect error for example also or and at the end you could do expect complete and that that was that was that was really nice um uh, so to answer your question in the community a lot of people are coming up with uh so i also for example uh used the uh, core routines with graphql and uh you know martin is my friend of mine and in the uh, apollo made a really nice library he had there's a module which has core routine support and that in itself, uh, how it's implemented has evolved. Uh, basically, uh, I wrote a blog post about that. So, and from my usage of it, 
and uh, and it's nice. And you know, provides a extension. So a lot of libraries commonly use like gRPC, GraphQL, you know, a lot of those open source libraries have coroutine components that you could use now and uh which is great <laughs> i i do have one more question before we kind of wrap up C coroutines and you know suspending functions are, are of course kind of the, the, the basic abstraction and i think people are, are, are using that that quite a lot but are there any kind of other abstractions on top of that that you'd like to see kind of come to fruition uh kind of as an example here i have a couple of friends who are uh, really excited about the whole erlang and elixir world with on, on the on the evm uh, and they do concurrency on top of like their actor model, right? And uh, Kotlin's coroutines does have well, they they certainly dabbled with with basic support for actors. Uh, so I'm just wondering, you got any thoughts in that direction, or maybe maybe something completely different that you would be looking forward to? I'll be yeah. So I have used actors and uh, helping many people to how do you handle shared mutable state? And uh, one pushback was that. Uh, you know, it's marked as deprecate. I think it's marked, it's marked that obsolete, but I know that, you know, complex actors will be introduced from what I heard. I think that would be, that'd be big and like just testing utilities. Uh, so, I mean, you know, uh, actors are really nice. It allows you to handle shared mutable state. And, uh, it's interesting that on Swift 5.5, they also have introduced actors and uh which is interesting uh to handle data races and uh, the other so complex actors another thing is that uh, and one of the challenges is with testing that's a big challenge with coroutines and having more utilities you know uh i think uh i know you know my french sean i think from google he worked on it and uh and uh i hope he adds more utilities in there and Roman. <laughs> You know, I smile because it's a, it, it feels like testing is a thorn on your side, right? You're either, um, yeah, because you, you do mention it a few times. That, and we had a question like, you know, what would you want improved? I think you don't need to answer that. I would uh, <laughs> improve, you know, how... Uh, testing. Better, better, you know, better ways to know, like, why... Why did your test, you know, why is it now like better errors? Like, for example, one common error is that, you know, you have a job which is not completed. Uh, you know, better to way to know which job it is, et cetera. Uh, with the co coroutine debugger, I mean, that, that, that's, what that was introduced, that has helped. But let me ask you this. If you've got a really, really good debugger and you've got print line, do you really need tests? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you know, I, I've thought about that a lot. I, uh, you still need it. You still do need it. <laughs> and if you want to run integration tests, all you do is uh, attach to production. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's a, <laughs> yeah. That, anyway. I think those are great ideas. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, I just sold on a, on a new way of uh, integration tests. It's uh, attached to the customer's machine. Right. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. Okay, I, I love it when I crack myself up. But anyway, um, we are running out of time, uh, Mohit. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. And I, I think we've got quite a few show notes we're going to be posting with uh, links. Uh, is there anything you want to uh, mention uh, specifically? Uh, well, no, no, I just uh, thank you for having me. Um, always listen to this podcast and uh it's always video helpful. cast now it's a video cast now video you can see us <laughs> yeah. that's true we're, and, we're uh, not calling it that no hadi uh, <laughs> no it's a vlog right yeah, it, is it, it not a vlog that, it's a video cast or, sounds like it's something from the 80s if you ask me okay so what okay so if a blog a video blog is a vlog a podcast that's on youtube is a is a is a vodcast? It's a, it's a vodcast. Yeah, I think that it's sounds good. It's a vodcast. Good. We just coined a new term. I'm <laughs> going to say vodcast exists. Um, and uh, folks can find you on uh, your Twitter handle, which is quite interesting, which is, I guess, Mohit was taken when you registered. Uh, so it's, uh, hey, it's Mohit, right? I, uh, yeah. So uh, 
Actually, I, I found that there was someone who had a who, who had a handle who started with "Hey it's and I thought, you know, that's a good idea. <laughs> it's a it's a better move than uh, you know putting putting the birth year afterwards. Uh, certainly, uh, you yeah, know, um, looks better. Okay, we're too late. Uh, what is vodcasting? Vodcasting after podcasting, it lets users subscribe to audio files. Comes vodcasting, the easiest way to bring internet video to your desktop. That is amazing. We're late. I can't believe I just made that up <laughs> and it exists. <laughs> oh, that, another thing I want to share is that if anyone is looking in the community, looking for a career team training or a workshop, um, definitely will help you out and do it for free. <laughs> Yeah. Uh. Sounds good. Um so I guess we'll uh, put your uh, we'll put your details and your your website as well into the show notes. Right? But but more importantly than you could do it for free, is it open source? No, actually that was the other way around. No. It's uh, more importantly than is it open source? Is it free? No. It's it's actually great that you're doing. It. All right, Mohit. Thank you so much for uh coming on the show. Uh, it was very nice having you. Uh Certainly got a lot of overviews and a bunch of details on teaching, learning, coroutines. And yes, absolutely. And in the spirit of uh, of our theme uh, for our second theme for today, no, our third theme, because our first theme is weather. Our second theme was Kotlin and uh, coroutines. And our third theme was uh, German. Uh, off we didn't say. Off we didn't say. Off we didn't enough. say. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Auf Wiedersehen. You have a good Auf one. Auf Wiedersehen. Okay? You too. I have to say it in a German way. Bye bye. Okay. And for all our subscribers that didn't listen, no, for our non subscribers that didn't listen to our message at the very beginning, what do you have to do? You have to like, you have to subscribe. And if you're really brave, you also have to hit that bell so you get notifications whenever new Kotlin content comes out on our channel. No, if you're really brave, you have to dislike. But if you dislike, leave a comment. Tell us why uh, you disliked it. Yeah. If you liked it, we don't care. We just want those thumbs up. But the thumbs down, we want an explanation. We want constructive criticism, people. Okay. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. I think you're the first person on YouTube to ask for dislikes. Let's see how no. that works out. <laughs> I have a strange feeling uh, some of the people producing this show together with us are having a little bit of a panic attack in the background. Now. <laughs> Good job. Well, we'll see how that works uh, probably in the next episode. Huh? By the way, for folks that are uh, for folks that are interested, uh, dislike in German is nicht gefallen. Yeah, that sounds about right. There you go. Yeah, I don't know why that was a theme for this episode, but uh, auf Wiedersehen. See you in the next one.